Hallelujah. Thank you, musicians and singers. We appreciate that ministry. Turn your Bibles to the book of Acts in chapter 4, and we'll begin there in verse 8 in just a moment. And, uh, you know, a number of years ago, I was preaching uh, somewhere, and uh, there was a young man in the church there, uh, and he said, Pastor, I know you like books. And uh, he said, I came across one. This guy's an avid reader. And he says, I, I want to I encourage you. To, uh, I think he gave it to me, uh, but uh, uh, I ended up getting the digital copy of it. Uh, and he says, I think that you would like this book. And the story, the intro, was about a... Uh, uh, piano player. This was a professional piano player, a concert pianist. His name was Bernard Gabriel. This is around 1946, just after the end of World War II. And this man uh, would, uh, uh, was there in New York City, and uh, he was involved with uh, all the different uh, entertainment venues that were there, Broadway, the plays, uh, symphonies and such. And so he would often go to auditions where he would have to play and to, in order to get the job. And he was very successful, but he noticed something. That very often while he was there, he would see many of the same people, uh, uh, professional musicians, and they would be in the back, they'd be warming up, and he would notice how good they were and how talented they were. But when it was time for the audition, they would choke. They would struggle, they could not play, and he was like, he noticed that when they were by themselves, they were doing great. But something about pressure and the possibility of people listening to them and they were struggling. And so he saw this so often that one day he put a little advertisement saying that uh, he was going to offer counsel to musicians who struggled with the auditions that they suffered from stage fright. And so he kind of put that out there, gave them an address, which was just a little music room uh, nearby where he lived. Um, and uh, the very first uh, group, four musicians showed up um, and he was there and he told them, I believe that I can cure you from stage fright. And so what he did is he asked one of them to come uh, play, it was a middle-aged woman. She had uh, her music there, you know, put her on the piano uh, and told her to play her music. And no matter what happens, don't stop playing. And so this woman began to play the music. Uh, and as she's playing her nice concert piece, uh, he walked around to the other three people and he began to give them uh, uh, little blowers, whistles, began to give them popcorn and different things uh, and then on his command, they were instructed to just blow uh, the whistles and throw popcorn at the lady uh, and scream and yell. Uh, and this woman started getting flustered. And he, don't stop, don't stop, keep playing. And she kept playing. And he's telling them louder, louder, throw more popcorn at her. And, uh, and finally, this woman, she's in tears uh, and she plays and she plays right through the piece. And then everybody starts cheering for her. And he took turns, and this became his method. Um, that group of four in a few months became 40. And people came, the word got out, uh, and uh, what he was trying to do was break the intimidation factor in them that kept them uh, from doing what they really wanted to do. It wasn't before long before a spinoff started for actors and for salesmen as this whole method, which now has a, they have a particular name for this, method back then that was called insane and yet this man it, it worked him and the name of this little group this advertisement he put in the paper was uh, the society of timid souls i want to preach a sermon tonight called the society of timid souls because the truth is a church very often is a society of timid souls I'm going to preach on boldness tonight, and we're going to go to Acts chapter 4, and uh, we're going to begin in verse 8, where the Bible says, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day are judged for a good deed done to a helpless man, by what means he has been made well, let it be known to you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, 
whom you crucified. What a powerful, powerful statement. Jesus from Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead by him. This man stands here before you hold. This is the stone which was rejected by you builders, which has become the chief cornerstone. Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And verse 13 says, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus, the society of timid souls. Father, help us tonight. God, I pray especially for men and women here who are frustrated because you want them to do so much more than they're doing right now. Break through the barrier of fear, intimidation. Give them Holy Ghost boldness. We ask this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, amen. So let's begin to talk about timidity tonight. So here we have one of the key moments of the early church. The backstory is that Peter and John were on their way to the temple at the hour of prayer when they encountered a lame man outside the gate. This man knows uh, that people of prayer are on their way in. Uh, and so he positions himself uh, to be able to capture them uh, in their uh, uh, feelings of uh, religious uh, uh, goodness and, and catching them when they're uh, in, a, in a place in their heart where they want to do, uh, please God. Uh, he's a pretty sharp man. Uh, and as he's there, he's asking for alms. He's asking for financial help. Uh, and what he really needs is uh, prayer. And the Bible says uh, that Peter and John ministered to that man. We know the story. Silver and gold have I none. Uh, such as I have, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Rise up and walk. Uh, and this man gets powerfully healed. He gets demonstrably healed. The Bible says he begins to jump around. He begins to draw a crowd. Uh, and Peter and John seized the moment uh, and began to preach the gospel so that thousands of people are gathered. Uh, the authorities come in, uh, break up the gathering, arrest the two young preachers, uh, and bring them to the Sanhedrin, which is the highest religious authority uh, of Israel. And we pick it up the story. Whereas they're asking them to give an account for what they did, Peter speaks up and he says these words in verse 11, this is the stone which was rejected by you builders. In other words, he's calling these men out. He's already said whom you crucified. Now he says you rejected him. He has become the chief cornerstone uh, and there is salvation, there is, nor is there salvation in any other there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. The brother was street preaching. He is ministering with power uh, and he's speaking to the Sanhedrin. Uh, and our focus tonight is the commentary made uh, of these religious leaders in verse 13. They saw the boldness of Peter and John. They perceived they were uneducated and untrained men. How many qualify for that right here? And they marveled and they realized they had been with Jesus. And so tonight it raises the issue of timid souls. It is pretty clear that the Sanhedrin, these men, were not prepared for this reaction from the disciples. They assumed that they would take Peter and John, put them in this place, uh, and the full force uh, of religious power would be there uh, in front of them. And they absolutely expected Peter and John to fold up like a cheap suit. They absolutely imagined that these young men would be so intimidated staring at these authorities uh, that they would fall apart uh, and, uh, and uh, they would be able to have their way with him. In my life, on a couple of occasions, uh, while traveling overseas, I have been detained. And uh, one of the things that I noticed in both instances, once in Russia and once in India, is that while I was detained, uh, that there was a whole elaborate projection of authority then this is done on purpose. I'm sure that if you speak uh, to some of our military and some of our policemen, 
They will tell you this, uh, that uh, they create a scenario where we have all the power uh, and you better do what we say. And as I sat there, I remember in Russia and we were being detained uh, and this big old uh, guy came in, the type of guy uh, that looks like he belongs in the octagon. A huge Russian man uh, had an old ring with a bunch of uh, old keys on it that suggested we're going to lock you up uh, and I remember uh, this guy walked in and I'm there, Pastor Sergei Gulabev uh, and Dave Marks are there and the few other people uh, and this man walks in and he's speaking in Russian in a very strong voice uh, and I'm just looking at this, the rings uh, and this guy's uh, 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 forearms are like this big and I'm thinking they're about to take me away uh, and he's, you know, how right. Even when he talked like this in Russian, it sounds me. And, uh, and uh, when he walked out, Sergei leaned over and goes, that man has dominion. And I mean to tell you, they, they knew what they were doing. They were projecting power. I'm in an office in India with about five older Indian men packed in this little office. They have my, pa and they're asking me about a particular stamp, uh, where I got this, and, and, and you, this is how it works. So these men are in this setting here uh, and, uh, and they, they are being pressed uh, and the idea is they will be afraid to assert any spiritual power or confidence. Moses goes before Pharaoh and everything in that presentation uh, is to suggest uh, I'm Pharaoh, I am in power and you have no power. We are introduced to Gideon. If you read uh, uh, Judges 6, uh, the Bible, the back story before Gideon is presented in the story is that uh, the people of Israel were now living in caves. This is chapter 6 of the book of Judges. I mean, the, so only six chapters have gone by from Joshua possessing the land. Uh, six chapters later, they're no longer possessing the land. They're hiding in caves. We're talking about this idea that we want to capture people God's people, uh, and we want them to live in fear and intimidation. We want to dominate them, and there's probably no greater picture of this in the Bible than Goliath, where words and images, he stands there and he speaks words, uh, and then we are told how tall he was, we're told about uh, his armor, we're told about his weaponry, uh, and, uh, and so in words and images, uh, a communicated power and strength, uh, so that the Bible says in 1 Samuel 17, 11, when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistines, they were dismayed, uh, and greatly afraid, uh, and the message translation says they were terrified uh, and lost all hope. The enemy tonight wants you and I to be intimidated. He wants us to live in fear. He projects strength uh, so that we think that he is in control, uh, he calls the shots, uh, and they want to use the intimidation uh, against us. Listen to this quote. It says, however, cosseted and comfortable the age, or perhaps because of it, our collective nerve is faltered. We seem to have forgotten how to step up to the plate, and our global media has surrendered to a taxonomy of terror, the planet warming, the banker squandering, the terrorist bomb making, the pedophile lying in wait. Whether justifiable or not, fear then becomes so infectious that once you are frightened about one thing, Suddenly, you are frightened about another and another and another, however commonplace. A Christian tonight can become a member of the Society of Timid Souls. The Christian this, e this evening can live out their Christian life with the knowledge of the will of God, um, but afraid to embrace that in their own life. They become timid. This can happen in our worship. I believe in being expressive in prayer. I have no problem lifting my hands. Uh, I don't do that because I'm a preacher. Long before that, uh, amen, somebody showed me a picture as a young convert. Uh, there I am in the front row, my little brown jacket, uh, amen, uh, hands lifted. Um, you'd be surprised how many Christians are afraid to be expressive in prayer. They're intimidated to clap their hands, to lift their voice, to lift their hands uh, because they're intimidated. They're not against it. It's not like uh, theologically you don't agree with expressive praise. You would love to enter into that, uh, but the enemy uh, has intimidated. You know there are people this evening that are intimidated to answer an altar call? 
They may feel convicted. They may be at a place in their life where they need that there'd be nothing more powerful for them than to come and to get on their knees. Uh, and, and, and they know, they say, this is great. This is powerful. And I know I should do that. Well, why don't I do it? I'm intimidated to do it. And the Sanhedrin stare them down. How many people tonight never witness, are afraid to speak up? The gospel of Jesus, maybe on your job or in your, in your circle. And you know that you should. There are people that God's brought into your life. There are the times where God has put on your heart. You're at H-E-B. Talk to them. Minister to them. And you hear those stories. Hey, Pastor, I would love to do that. I know I should do that, uh, but we don't do it. Why? Because we're intimidated. How I many know we can be intimidated to pray for people? Intimidated to contend for a miracle, to just say, can I pray for you? You're in pain. Let's pray together. Many of us know a great deal about praying for the sick more than, more than most Christians. Thank God for Pastor Mitchell, who said, I'm going to teach you everything that I know. And that you can do that uh, anywhere you, and, and we know that. And we say, oh, wouldn't that be a wonderful thing? But what happened? Intimidation. And the churches are filled with people uh, that know what they ought to do. Uh, they're like those piano players. Uh, they're great. Uh, but when they are put into the moment, they're afraid. And the reality is that the church is filled with a society of timid souls. Let's move along then. Let's talk about transformation. Because I want to tell you tonight, God wants to help you. I don't say that to shame you. I'm not talking about cowardice tonight. But I'm telling you, you and I can believe that God can do more for us. Boldness is a mark of conversion. Boldness is a mark of conversion. You know, this idea that before I was saved, you know, that I lifted my hand. I didn't do that. Sometimes people will look at a person who's expressive in their, and say, well, I'm not like that. None of us were like that, but we got saved. And so here the Sanhedrin realized that they had underestimated these two young men. To them, confidence and boldness was acquired through knowledge and education. In their mind, the way this works uh, is you go to school, you learn a few things, uh, you have a level of achievement, uh, and uh, you take that, uh, and then you're able to stand up and speak. In their culture, that is how it works. A young man was considered an, an upstart or a usurper if uh, he was already boldly speaking. It's like, no, no, young man, you need to keep your mouth shut uh, and uh, do your time, pay your dues, uh, and uh, get uh, all this training and education, and then you'll have the right to speak. That is how they thought. These two young men come in, uh, and then all of a sudden, title uh, no longer works, uh, and the Bible says uh, they were uneducated and untrained men. They were Galilean fishermen, uh, and the conclusion of the Sanhedrin is the only reason they could do this uh, is they realized they had been with Jesus. And these men came to the conclusion that time spent with Jesus took men who would normally be timid and made them bold. Time spent with Jesus took men that would otherwise be quiet and afraid and gave them incredible confidence. And I submit to you, if it's true for Peter and John, it's true for any one of us. That time spent with Jesus, that confidence flows from our relationship with Jesus Christ. And the Sanhedrin deduced that. See, the danger is that we tend to see it as a personality trait. But that's just that guy. He's an extrovert. What's an extrovert? Big mouth. That this is somebody who speaks up, has no problem. They were the class clown, you know, that kind of guy. But, and we see it that I'm not like that. How many here have ever read Dale Carnegie's book, How to Win Friends and Influence People? And he has all sorts of little things that you can do, you know, repeat their name over again. People, have, you know, they say the most favorite sound to a person is the sound of their own. Hi, Richard, Richard. Hey, Richard, it's hot outside. Hey, Rich. And, and you know, and, they, and, and that, you know, all these little gimmicks and get people to talk about themselves and, and, and all of that. I, I'm only reading that from reading about. I haven't read the book. What I'm saying to you, though, is this idea, that's all it is. It's gimmickry. 
You know, it's just learning how to do these things. That is not at all what the Bible says. They follow Jesus and then unlock something in them. Those three years they spent with Jesus, something happened to them. Somehow a life of Jesus working in them brought some. I'm going to give you two reasons why today. Number one, this has to do with righteousness. It has to do with righteousness. Proverbs 28, 1. The wicked flee when no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. I want to say tonight that guilt depletes us. Guilt depletes us. Guilt robs us of confidence. Sin makes us insecure. When we are not right, we're very insecure. You know, our judgment play, I, I really enjoy our judgment play. Uh, it's not, the, the concept is not original. Obviously, plays like that have been done many, many times. But I kind of like the way it's been kind of souped up. Uh, and one of the features is these people who are uh, lost. They have now died in a, in a mass shooting. And uh, they awaken to stand before judgment um, and uh, they're there and uh, the, uh, some of them are like well, I'm a good person I've done good works and or I was in church and uh, and it's very very good but what's interesting is as uh, their sin begins to be exposed to the use of video it goes back into their life but while they're coming to grips with the reality of their sin very interesting that these demons appear these demons began moving around them. And as they're talking, they're shooing them away. And they're, they want to reject. I'm right with God. I know I'm right with God. And I did good works or I went to church. And, and there's, and, but as they're defending themselves, they're constantly having to shoo away these demons. that are. And what, what a clever imagery because that's what happens when you feel guilty. You know what we call this a lot of times? Anxiety. And the idea here is that we lose confidence. We become insecure. Something we know isn't right inside of us. Uh, the wicked flee when no man pursues, but the righteous are as bold uh, as a lion. Jesus Christ cleansing us from sin. Repenting, making our heart right with God. Deciding that we are now going to follow Jesus. That doesn't mean we're perfect, but there's a confidence now. That when we're standing, we're standing on the finished work of Calvary's cross. Who else but Peter, this man who had denied the Lord, who 50 days later on the day of Pentecost so, Pentecost so boldly preaches. And then two chapters later in our text stands in front of these men with such confidence. These Sanhedrin, every one of them would have known that Peter denied the Lord. Every one of them would have known about Peter, the traitor. Peter who caved in but here they are looking at this man and basically we know you we know what you did we know all about your failure uh, and they're trying to understand uh, how can a young man uh, speak so confidently I'll tell you why because of the blood of Jesus Christ tonight uh, that cleanses from sin and people begin to minister with authority not only is it righteousness it's the power of the Holy Spirit God has not given us the spirit of fear. Literally, it means the spirit of timidity, but of prayer, power, love, and of a sound mind. The Holy Spirit can overrule a spirit of intimidation in your life. The Holy Spirit can give you confidence and dominion and rule over natural timidity. There are people that are naturally quieter we use the term shy i don't want to draw attention to myself i would rather be a fly on the wall and we say those things and yet at the same time there's another side where the holy spirit prompts us and says i need you to speak up i need you to act right now i need you to get involved and there's this conflict because, the Lord, I'm not like that. That's not my personality. And the Holy Spirit says, my spirit can overrule your timidity. 
Most Bible commentators believe that Timothy, Paul is writing this letter to this young man. We all know his story, raised by a mother and a grandmother. His mother was a Jew, his father was a Gentile. We don't know what happened. We don't know if the guy was, what's suggested is that he wasn't even part of his life. Um, we know that Timothy was emotional. The Bible talks about his tears. It talks about even having stomach issues and having physical issues. And that he would write to the Apostle Paul. And it's, you can develop a whole character uh, a sketch of this man based on how Paul spoke to him. Um, and yet, uh, Paul says to him, you do not have to have an intimidated spirit. The Holy Spirit can overrule that. It is no accident uh, that Peter the failure uh, was baptized in the Holy Ghost and immediately uh, preached to the very people he caved into seven weeks later because the power of the Holy Spirit overruled uh, the intimidation that was on his life. God tonight uh, can help you. Let me close and talk about a testimony tonight and we'll finish up. Your boldness is part of your testimony. I'm glad tonight if Jesus set you free from drugs and alcohol, I'm glad that he set you free from a bad temper. I'm glad that he set you free from uh, road raging on loop 410. But has he set you free from intimidation? The scripture says that they saw this. This was a testimony. It would be as if they saw somebody that used to just be bound by meth and they're set free. Or they said that brother was an alcoholic. Or that man was lazy, could never keep a job. Or that woman was a runaround Sue. And you're looking at them, you're saying, wow, look at what Jesus has done. They saw boldness and confidence uh, and the Sanhedrin, uh, these men who were diametrically opposed to the gospel had to admit something happened to these men and it was Jesus. What a powerful thing when people who knew us before we were saved were able to look at us and say they have changed because of Jesus. And I'm telling you tonight, this can be your testimony. You do not have to walk out of here saying, well, pastor, that's nice, but that's new. I am. I'm here to tell you that Jesus can do something in your life right here. And he can give you boldness. He can give you confidence. I, I, I got to confess, I'm always on you guys for forgetting what the announcements were, but I, I, I missed one. I don't know. Did they announce an outreach today after church? No. I see a thumb up. Is there a thumb up? There is an outreach today. Amen. Okay. 30 minutes afterwards. Haral and Marbach. There's an outreach 30 minutes after service tonight. <laughs> to test what I'm preaching on. And say, God, you can change me. Right here. Think for a minute about the Gadarene demoniac. The Bible introduces us to this man in the book of Mark chapter five. And when we find is that Jesus and the disciples have come on their boat across the Sea of Galilee. And as they come to the shoreline in the area called Gadara, Gadara was an area that the Romans had built a fort. And so there were a lot of Roman soldiers in the area and the, the, the merchants there, even though they were good Jews, knew that uh, the Romans liked pork, like the Filipinos. Uh, and so they, uh, they began to have, they had, they had pig herds there because they had this Roman army to feed. And uh, they were there. And in this setting right here where they were doing all this, there was a, a, a madman. And the Bible says this man uh, had lost his mind. Uh, he ran around naked. He frequented the cemeteries. Uh, he was a cutter. You think cutting started with little girls in the 21st century. He was a cutter. And oh, one other thing. He was filled with demons. Cutter, listen to me. He was filled with demons. And that's what's driving cutting in your life. This guy had trouble. This guy had major emotional problems. And yet, according to the Bible, his emotional problems were actually spiritual problems. He was filled with demons. 
and they dominated him. Jesus comes ashore. You know, this says that the, uh, these first century people tried to deal with this the only way they knew how. The Bible says they bound him with chains because he was going to hurt himself or he was going to hurt other people. And so they actually captured this guy and uh, they didn't use uh, antidepressants. They bound him with chains, which sometimes are the same thing. And the Bible says it didn't work. He break the chains. And the Bible says when Jesus comes ashore, this man sees Jesus and uh, somehow understands that this man has power. And he fights through the will of 6,000 demons. See, how do you know 6,000? Because when that man ran and fell down at Jesus' feet, he, he said, what is your name? He says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Roman legion with 6,000 soldiers. He falls down at Jesus' feet. And Jesus begins to speak to the demons. The demons are ordered into a herd of swine that are there to feed the Roman soldiers nearby. The herd of swine are so tormented by the demons that they race into the Sea of Galilee and are drowned. This man is totally, completely delivered and the Bible says that when the people uh, of the community, the pig farmers, came running out because they heard the squealing of the pigs and they come running uh, and they see their livelihood drowning in the water. And then they look and they see this guy, this crazy guy running around naked in the tombs and all. And they see him. And the Bible says he put on clothes. How I many know when you get saved, you put on clothes? He put on clothes and the Bible says uh, he was sitting down. That means he was calm. He wasn't agitated, wasn't worked up all the time. He was just calm and he was in his right mind. So, oh, what a miracle that Jesus can do that. I believe he can still do it. Can you say, man, that he can still do that? And then the pig farmers saw that. They looked down at all their pigs that were drowning and they got mad. Because, as it's been said, some people care more for pigs than people. And they were upset, and they began to riot, began to form, and they began to tell, get out of here, get out of here, you ruined us, we're, we're broke, get out of here. And the Bible says, as the mob grew, Jesus and his disciples began to make their way back to the boat to get out of there. As this mob got angrier and angrier, and here's this man that's been totally healed and delivered, and I can see him standing in between Jesus and the boat and this mob. And so you know what the man said? He said, can I go with you to Jesus? Can I go with you? And Jesus said, no, no, I'm not going to let you go with you. In fact, put the scripture up. Jesus said to him, go home to your friends. Now, let's stop right here. I'm sure when he looked at the mob, he said, what friends? They're not my friends. <laughs> Go home to your friends and tell them what great things the Lord has done for you and how he has had compassion on you. And he departed and began to proclaim in Decapolis all that Jesus had done for him and all marveled. You know, a lot of times when we think about the, the uh, adjectives that are used, to describe him, we say he was clothed, he was sitting, he was in his right mind. But sometimes we forget the fourth one, he proclaimed. This antisocial dude, this psycho, this man that society was afraid of, this guy who was totally messed up. When Jesus touched him, not only did he settle him down and give him back his dignity, that's what clothes our dignity, but he also broke something in him so that he was no longer intimidated to speak. And when he spoke, everyone marveled. And you know what they were marveling about is this guy, man, this guy was so quiet. This guy would never talk. This guy had all these issues. His testimony was that God set him free from intimidation and he was able to speak. I'm telling you tonight, he can give you a breakthrough. He can give you a breakthrough. And I close with a story that I like to use. I've shared it with this congregation before. It says this, it says, Jack Hiles was raised by an abusive and alcoholic father. 
First year after high school, as he sat in church one night, he realized very definitely that God wanted him to surrender to preach. How could little Jackie boy be a preacher? At 18 years of age, he still sucked his thumb. How could this introvert ever speak to others? Yet, that night he surrendered to God's call to preach. At the end of the service, Joe Boyd, the famous football player, walked down the aisle to tell the pastor he had surrendered to be a preacher. Then, when the preacher announced that little Jackie Boy Hiles has also come to be a preacher, a hush fell over the congregation. The pastor said, folks, let's pray for Jackie. Jack's first sermon was three minutes of stammering, stuttering, a false start, and a tearful exit. One night, Jack's father came to hear him preach. After the service, he begged his father to get saved. His father promised that he would soon, that he would soon, but there wasn't enough time. Shortly thereafter, he died of a heart attack. He was a drunkard, and as far as, he is, as is known, he never did trust the Lord Jesus Christ for forgiveness. His son spent hours on his father's grave, praying and crying, and calling out to God for his power to reach men. He begged for God's spirit to touch, to, so that he could touch men's hearts, that they would turn to God. After this time, when he preached, God's power began to fall. Little Jackie boy, the thumb-sucking, insecure introvert, who stood to preach for three minutes and sat down in tears, pastored the largest church in the world for 41 years. Attendants averaged 20,000 weeklies, and for many years they baptized over 8,000 each year. God wants to help you tonight. He wants to help you. He wants to give you breakthrough. Let's bow our heads. Our heads are bowed and we're before God tonight. No one moving about. You know, I said in this sermon that sin robs us of confidence. Sin depletes us. Sin is what causes us to have the fear of being discovered, the fear of standing, uh, uh, of, of exposure, all those horrible, horrible things. I want to tell you tonight, Jesus Christ loves you. He loved you so much that he took your sin and my sin upon himself. He died in our place, suffered for us so that we could find forgiveness you know, they claim that if people in mental institutions would understand they're forgiven, uh, there would be no people in mental institutions because it does something to a shame and guilt, a violated conscience. But the Bible says the blood of Jesus Christ can purge us from dead works. It can cleanse us from sin, heal us. The sinless Son of God became our sin. Before I do anything else, I want to give you an opportunity to get right with God tonight. You can be cleansed. You can be forgiven. Jesus Christ can change your life. He rose from the dead. He is at the right hand of the Father, ever making intercession for us. And tonight, you need him to forgive you. You need him to change your life. I'm not asking you to join a church. I'm asking you to come to Christ just as you are, a sinner. Say, God, I repent tonight. I turn. From now on, I want to follow you. I want to trust you as my Lord and Savior. If that's you and you say, Pastor Ruby, I need prayer tonight, I'd like you to just raise your hand right now. My heads are bowed and Christians are praying and saying, pray for me, Pastor. I'm not right with God. I need Jesus tonight. Here's my hand. Pray for me. Sip it up. Before I move on, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. Lift up your hand. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Or you're backslidden, you're not right with God. Here's my hand. Pray for me. Amen. The society of timid souls. God's dealing with us tonight. Saying, God, I need you to help me. Because it's true. There are so many things you put in my heart to do. There are times where I feel like now's the time to speak up. Now's the time to act. And then that voice of Goliath stands in front of me shouts me down. Jesus tonight can give you and I an authority and a dominion, confidence. It doesn't reside in us, but in him, in us. Tonight, God wants to help some people here. He wants to give you a breakthrough. We're going to stand together right now. 
We're going to sing a worship song, and as we do, I want to invite you to come down and find a place to pray. Let's all stand, allowing people behind, past you to come to an altar. So God, I need you to do a work in my life. I need you to help me here. And give me a breakthrough. These altars are open. Let's worship God. And we you are the treasure that I seek. You are my all in all. Seeking you as a precious jewel. this is exactly the battle that I struggle with is the intimidation to respond to when God is prompting me. Maybe it's worship, answering an altar call, opening my mouth and witnessing to somebody, praying for somebody, saying, God, you, you can help me here. And I want that in my life. I want you to pray with me. I want you to say, Father, in the name of Jesus, I take authority over the spirit of intimidation that's upon my life. Tonight, I have been with Jesus. By the power of your Holy Spirit, give me boldness. Uh, give me the ability to hear when you deal with me that I will no longer be ashamed, but I will worship, I will witness, and I will pray with your power. It is not me but it is you in me and I receive the promise in Jesus name let's pray together right now Father God I ask you for a breakthrough I take authority over the spirit of intimidation and fear God I cast out all anxiety God I plead the blood that brings a sense of purity and holiness and dominion over your people God I pray let ministry flow through these lives signs and wonders and miracles uh, stretch forth your hand through your people uh, 
let all that see uh, know that Jesus has been among them. Uh, we give you praise. Let's give God praise together right now. Thank you, Jesus. you go tonight 30 minutes it is now 8 14 and as soon as so at 8 45 right on there it say man i prayed i you know we were praying for you for healing we would say check yourself wouldn't we check yourself tonight go over there and uh say hey i'm gonna get out there and i'm gonna speak and i'm gonna act on this right now and i'm gonna be free hallelujah let's bow our heads we're gonna let you go appreciate you tonight to remember services uh wednesday night next sunday night water baptism you can make sure you see pastor martinez and get you all set up uh for that uh, thank god for everything that is doing chris gonzalez can you dismiss us <laughs>